again, Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror mm. is uh, teaching you that it's your responsibility to, to just improve yourself. You know, if you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make the change. This whole concept of, again, I mean, all of these songs, you can listen to them shallowly or you can just listen to them and say, oh, there's deeper meaning here. And I think there's a certain philosophy of, of song as a way of touching the psyche. So if you look at regions of the brain, people who have lost their language ability because they have an accident in that region of the brain can actually sing mm -hmm. because it's exactly the symmetric region of the brain. Wow. And that again, teaches you so much about language evolution and sort of the, the duality of musicality and you know rhythmic patterns and eventually language. Do you have a sense of why songs developed? So you're kind of suggesting that it's possible that there is something important about our connection with song and with music on the level of the importance of language. Is it possible? That that, that... It's not just possible. In my view, language comes after music. Language comes after song. <laughs> no, seriously. Like basically my view of human yeah. cognitive evolution yeah. is rituals. If you look at many early cultures, there's rituals around every stage of life. There's organized dance performances around mating. Mm -hmm. And if you look at mate selection, I mean, that's an evolutionary drive right there. So basically, if you're not able to string together a complex dance as a bird, you don't get a mate. And that actually forms this development for many song learning birds. Not every bird knows how to sing and not every bird knows how to learn a, a complicated song. So basically there's birds that simply have the same few tunes that they know how to play. And a lot of that is inherent and genetically encoded. And others are birds that learn how to sing. And the, you know, if you look at a lot of these exotic birds of paradise and stuff like that, like the mating rituals that they have are enormously amazing. And I think human mating rituals of, you know, ancient tribes are not very far off from that. And in my view, the sequential formation of these movements is a prelude to the cognitive capabilities that ultimately enable language. <laughs> it is fascinating to think that that's uh, not just an accidental precursor to intelligence. Yeah, it's uh, sexually selected. It's well, it's sexually selected, and it's a prerequisite. Yeah, it's like it's yeah. required for yeah. intelligence. And and even as language has now developed. I think the artistic expression is needed, like badly needed by our brain. So it's not just that, oh, our brain can kind of, you know, take a break and go do that stuff. No, I mean, you know, uh, I don't know if you remember that scene from, oh gosh, what's that Jack Nicholson movie in New Hampshire? Uh, all, all work and no play make Jack a dull boy. <laughs> a dull boy. Uh, the Shining. The Shining. <laughs> so there's this amazing scene where he's constantly trying to, to concentrate and what, what's coming out of the typewriter is just gibberish. Yeah. And I have that image as well when I'm, when I'm working. And I'm like, no, that basically all of these crazy, you know, huge number of hobbies that I have, they're not just tolerated by my work. They're required by my work this ability of sort of stretching your brain in all these different directions is connecting your emotional self and your cognitive self. And that's a prerequisite to being able to be cognitively capable, at least in my view. Yeah, I wonder if the world without art and music, you're just making me realize that perhaps that world would be not just devoid of fun things to look at or listen to, but devoid of all the other stuff, all the, bridges and rockets and science. Exactly, and exactly. Creativity is not disconnected from art. And, you know, my kids, I mean, you know, I could be doing the full math treatment to them. No, they play the piano and they play the violin and they play sports. I mean, this whole, you know, sort of movement and going through mazes and playing tennis and, you know, playing soccer and avoiding obstacles and all of that, that forms your three-dimensional view of the world being able to actually move and run and play in three dimensions is extremely important for math, for you know, stringing together complicated concepts. It's the same underlying cognitive machinery that is used for navigating mazes and for navigating theorems mm -hmm. and sort of solving equations. So I can't, you know, I can't have a conversation with my students without you know, sort of either using my hands yeah. or opening the whiteboard in Zoom and just constantly drawing. 
or you know, back when we had in-person meetings, just the whiteboard in my office. Whiteboard, yeah, that that's fascinating to think about.